continually evolving. Today, we witness a shift in tourism paradigm. And the cultural knowledge that we have uh, is very important. Um, this one is an Ifugao Bulul that has been lent to us. To. Same screen. So we, what we need to do is just get the first layer and the top layer, the measurement. We will now be sure that you will not be consultant dependent and you will now be able to put together your own museums with this assistance from the others. The basic tools that we set up the studio, the camera that you're comfortable with, together with it. Um, also, generally, um, museum staff are advised not to pursue. In doing that, I'd like to focus on the two important words in that formulation, which is to curate and to exhibit. To curate uh, is to So why are museums important? Because museums and galleries give us an insight um, into the history of humankind. So even John Dewey, um, who is a prominent leader in
Okay, good morning everybody. Um abig abukla, no? Good morning greetings from Iba Sambales. Madiyao na Aldao from Agusan uh, Sur, no? And then uh, maray na Aldao po sa Gabos at maayo maupay nga aga sa iyong nga tanan, no? Ganda ng mga greetings natin from uh, different places, no? So good morning everybody. Welcome to week 9, day 2 of our museum management training. Uh, and our topic this morning is on the role of natural history in uh, museums, no? university museums. So yesterday we had a very um, productive um, and meaningful talk with um, Dr. Cecilia de la Paz, who's the director of OICA uh, from UP Diliman. No? So today, uh, tignan na naman din natin yung natural sciences, no? the uh, university museums. Okay, I would like now to introduce our um, special resource person today who's now on sabbatical in the U.S., but we ask him to spend the morning uh, with us uh, today. So Dr. Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez is currently a professor in zoology at the Animal Biology Division of the Institute of um, uh, Zoology. Uh, Institute of Biological Sciences at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. He completed both his BS and MS in Zoology at UP Los Baños and earned his PhD in Zoology at the University of Oxford uh, through the support of the Ford Foundation International Fellowships Program. Across his 27 years of UPLB, at UPLB, recognition was given for his scholarly outputs and innovative uh, efforts in instruction, research, and extension, especially in the field of zoology, uh, wildlife biology, and systematics. He was the recipient of the UPLB CASAA 20, uh, 2002 Outstanding Alumni for Extension. UPLB 2008 Outstanding Teacher Award for uh, Biological Sciences and the Outstanding UPLB Alumnus Award for Wildlife Research and Conservation in 2019. Dr. Gonzalez has been a recipient of several UP International Paper Awards, professional chairs, won UP faculty grants, and conferred as UP Scientist II in 2014. He was bestowed the 2011 Outstanding Young Scientist Award for zoology by the, by the National Academy of Science and Technology in the Philippines. In 2015, he was appointed as director of uh, the UPLB Museum of Natural History. This is an integrative multi-awarded research and service unit of UP Los Baños, uh, mandated to document and promote the Philippines' uh, rich bio biological diversity. So uh, let's uh, listen uh, to Dr. Gonzalez, good morning, sir. We hello, uh, yeah, Hi. hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, <laughs> okay, so our topic for today is also another uh, of interest no? and a request from our participants on how to deal with uh, the natural history component no? for university museums, since most of the uh, ones discussed earlier are more on ethnographic museums, historical museums, no? and uh, those uh, uh, biography museums or special interest museums. So today we're going to talk about uh, natural history museums. Okay. Thank, Thank you very away. much. Okay. Okay, so I'll just share my screen here. Hopefully, um, you ever been able to see this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So again, um, good morning and good evening for those who are the same uh, time time soon as I am, but um, I'm very much thankful for uh, Dr. Morris for inviting me to be back here um, and then give you an insight on um, natural history museums in, in universities, particularly university museums. Um, so yes, I have been on sabbatical, so tapos na po ako mag-director ng museum. The new museum director is Dr. DeLeon. I'll, I'll give you the information a bit later on. But yeah, so I finished my two terms as director of the Museum of Natural History uh, in UP Los Baños. Um, now on my sabbatical, and um, I still want to 
help out and introduce, introduce to you the, the role of natural history in museums or natural history collections as part of this amazing uh, museum management training. So the role of natural history museums and their collections are quite important globally. Um, I think everybody is, for those who have been able to visit museums around the world, not necessarily university museums, but museums in, in general, especially the, the large natural history collections. This is the one in Senckenberg in Frankfurt. Um, I think an amazing uh, collection of menageries, originally just curios, then became an important reference collection, of course. Nowadays, it, it is a reference collection for understanding climate change uh, because of that, all that historical data that comes across it. Um, it's part of our aim to document and study our natural heritage. Uh, Naturally, this is part of our heritage. And if you see here a picture of the Stongilodon macrobotris, which we call the jade vine, or is basically in your five peso coin. It's part of our heritage. It is one of Charles Darwin's most favorite flowers. Um, so it's something that we need to educate the public about this importance of our own heritage. Of course, not just nationally, but also globally. And it's for, of course, our major aim to preserve them and to benefit not just us, but also our future generations. So here's an example of some of the, uh, the exhibits at the Senckenberg. So you see amazing. Uh, so it's not necessarily the biological specimens per se. You can also create models. So the fish here are actually modeled from actual fish. Some of the fossils are actually models. Most of them are kept in lock and key in, uh, in, the, in, in vaults in their collection. But one of the amazing things when I visited the Senckenberg was seeing a collection of uh, um, so sort of uh, odds and uh, different places. But one feature was a tarsier, the Philippine tarsier that was collected by Jose Rizal from the Pita. And that was like amazing. Uh, yes, it's been quite a while, uh, several hundred pounds ago that um, Ikin and I, Dr. Morris and I were in Oxford. And um, that's where I did my, uh, a lot of studies on historical DNA. Um, also visited a lot of amazing at museums, not just to collect the samples, but also, uh, you know, enjoy and visit these amazing collections. So here's the one from the National History Museum in London. There's one from uh, the Norwich Museum. And of course, the one below is that amazing long uh, whale skeleton at the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. So another aim of, the, of these natural history collections is to infuse the relevance of natural history studies to everyday life. It's like, how do you attach yourself to imports? It's not just climate change that affects you, but also a lot of things that we must understand, like pollination and, uh, allows us to have fruits and food. And of course, there's uh, a lot of other interactions between these organisms that help maintain and balance our, uh, our ecosystems. So it's, it's applications to understanding environmental functions and ecological services that we need to look into. So it's not just the behavior or the life history of these species, but how it affects us uh, directly. Of course, everybody knows that butterflies are nectivores or nectar feeders and help in turn pollinate the flowers. It's amazing that uh, my job allows you to travel, of course, attending conferences, but also uh, allows you to visit all the other amazing museums around the world. I think for me, one of the best is the Field Museum. It also has one of the most relevant collections of not, uh, um, natural history uh, in the, from the Philippines that are in the US. Um, so aside from their exhibits, they also have an amazing set of reference collections. Uh, so a lot of birds, mammals were collected in the Philippines and of course now deposited in the Field Museum. I think uh, Dr. Amoris would agree also an important uh, ethnographic uh, museum, uh, ethnographic collection, because we actually uh, met there uh, a few years back. Uh, during our research. Here's the Carnegie Museum uh, of Natural History. Uh, so they hosted one of the um, uh, museum conferences. Um, so there's several museum organizations around the world. There's uh, ICOM, uh, and they have like two versions, but this uh, features natural history, but also all features um, university museums or UMAC. Um, so it's one of ways that you can um, visit these museums when attending these conferences, but also, uh, again, there are, you have research involving uh, other collections because the Carnegie also has important collections from the Philippines. 
So another major area of these collections is education and technical services, which are crucial for not just educational programs in a university, but also uh, before pre-university, uh, K-12, preschool. So you can actually um, kind of develop your exhibits um, that will cater not just to the general public, but also to cater to uh, the educational system. So uh, what would be useful for them? Um, so it supports ours also a bit more uh, focused on university uh, study. So it supports student research as well, uh, in particularly in biodiversity conservation and bioproducts development. So you have a lot of these more specific areas of research and of course exhibits would show that. So I was uh, being here in California, the, the, the closest National History Museum for me is uh, the LA County Museum, which is an amazing set of exhibits. Uh, although there are other universities which have uh, their own collections here, you see Irvine Astor Collection, you see LA has their own collection, you see San Diego has their collection. Of course, it's an amazing area where you have uh, not just from uh, the region, but also around the world. So hopefully the Philippines would get that as well, because most of our exhibits portray regional and national collections. But again, um, it's not just about uh, dioramas and exhibitions. We also have to teach uh, the public um, things that are around us. So there are some exhibits which are not necessarily uh, the magnificent um, taxidermied lions and giraffes, but some species that you find around you. So here's are some, there's an exhibit here of uh, parrots that were released or escaped these into California and now of course inhabit uh, the area. So they're from South America or Africa. So those invasive species um, exhibit. So this shows you about invasion biology and what effects they have on the natural environment. So again, I'd like to thank the um, uh, Museo de Llora, uh, uh, University of the Philippines Baguio, and um, the uh, Commission on Higher Education for um, putting this together, this uh, amazing training program year two. So uh, we try to focus on not just the natural history museums and the collections per se, but towards what we call our university museums for us, which is a bit more um, say localized or... So I think one of the first collections that are known are the ones from Atena de Manila, the Academy of Natural Sciences. Sadly, that original collection uh, was uh, uh, was lost in the fire. So you still see this amazing set of collections of taxidermy specimens, uh, birds, reptiles. We even have this uh, Asiatic uh, elephant taxidermy. But so, uh, Jose Rizal, during his time at Inher de Milo, would have used these and inspired him. Uh, that's why he has uh, some knowledge of collection and when he was in the Pita. And of course, that was fortified when he was in. Um, uh, USD, Universidad de Santo Tomas, which of course has the first natural history collection uh, in, the, in the Philippines, the, the oldest university. So they have the Museo de Historia de Naturales, um, which is amazing, cat, uh, amazingly cataloged by uh, Father Castro de Alera. So here were some of the photos I take from their uh, this old magazine that they had, um, which shows the collections prior to the new one. So they have uh, the collections, part of the collections on exhibition at the main building. Uh, but uh, I think they still have a lot of, of unexhibited, the ones outside exhibit. But it's, it's still an amazing uh, thing to say to all these collections. Hopefully uh, they will be on exhibit soon. Uh, anybody from USD around? In the... So they have uh, renamed it the USD Museum of Arts and Sciences, I think sometime in the 80s. Again, they're changing it to USD Museum per se because they have, it covers a lot of things now, not just the natural sciences. Um, amazing collection. And even to, uh, they're loaning some of their amazing collections to our own Natural History Museum, um, which is the National Museum because they had the collections of the Pelican uh, and the uh, Cyrus Crane, which of course is now, it's both are extirpated. Uh, the Luzon Cyrus Crane is now extinct. So they have loaned their specimens to 
uh, our own National Museum for exhibition. So if you want to see that, uh, go to the National Museum. Okay, uh, focusing on university museums, I've been to a few uh, uh, to emphasize on some. Uh, one of the amazing collections I've seen are the ones from the University of Marburg. Uh, they have uh, uh, not just on exhibition, so at, the set, at their own biology department, there's a skeleton of an elephant in the middle of the lobby. So, so it's like, oh, wow, amazing. Then you go to their research collection, their reference collection, it's amazing as, as well. Um, but of course, having to work on historical data, I work at the uh, uh, Oxford University Museum National History Collection, as well as uh, the, the University of, University Museum Zoology Collection in Cambridge, where I uh, took out the topads samples from birds to extract DNA, of course, look into their phylogeny. I've also done um, take uh, to topad samples from Ben Raffles Museum uh, of the National University of Singapore, which is now redeveloped and amazingly beautiful. They have their own building now uh, called the Bikong Chian Natural History Museum. Uh, for me, one of the most earliest, I think it's over 100 years old, but also a lot of impact as a university museum. So we have a lot of museums in the US that are well known, you know, like the, the, the American Museum of Natural History, the USNM, Smithsonian, the Museum. All of these are kind of museums on their own right but not in university days. So I think one of the amazing ones and the earliest is the one from the University of Kansas, the Biodiversity Institute and Natural History Museum. So there's an amazing set of teaching and reference collections. So here's some of them. This is from their bird collection when I visited the, the KU uh, Museum. Uh, they also have a lot of collaboration with the Philippines. So they have a lot of specimens uh, also from the Philippines. Let's go and check. Is it okay with time? Just gonna check with our chat. Okay. Yes, we have enough time, Dr. Gonzalez. Okay. And aside from the reference collection, they also have a collection on exhibit. And of course, to emphasize not just on the dioramas of these amazing ecosystems across the US, uh, but also uh, a lot of things that allow their visitors to understand, like these. Um, exhibits which allow tactile recognition, so fur and feathers that you can touch. So the museums often say, oh, do not touch. But here, there are areas and, and, and um, um, kind of modules that allow you to touch and, of course, be more interactive um, for specimens that you can view through a microscope or things that can be handled. Of course, in the Philippines, <laughs> a lot of our universities also have their own collections. And I've been to several of them. I'm sorry if I've not been able to mention all of them. I'll just mention several. Um, of course, one of the one I went to collect samples are from uh, Sidiman University in uh, in Lumaquete. So they have the Natural Science Museum. They have one of the three main collections of Dr. Rabor for birds and mammals. Um, the other one is here is in the University of the Philippines, Spanos. And the third one is in, Emma, in Mindanao State University in Marawi in the Akkan Museum. So again, another amazing collection of, of, of wildlife. Um, um, MSU IIT, the Institute of Technology, also has their own natural science museum, most well-developed, um, uh, which also has some of these reference collections from Rabor. Um, MSU Tawi Tawi uh, focuses more on marine um, environments, and basically they have this long, uh, uh, full skeleton of a whale at their um, Mini Museum in, 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 in Tawi Tawi. Um, University of Carlos also has uh, a, di a few dioramas set around, but I think you also have an amazing reference collection. Uh, UP Didiman has an exhibition at the first floor of the Institute of Biology, but they also have an amazing reference collection, um, um, including those of the collection of Pernuto Manuel de La Paz are in Didiman. Um, besides, the university has an amazing entomological collection. Uh, which I've seen. And of course, uh, Central Mindanao University also has a separate museum um, apart from their research uh, um, institute. Um, of course, USD, as I mentioned, you've seen uh, one of the earliest um, the natural history museums. So I'm using <laughs> the MNH or the UPLB MNH as sort of an example for to look into how 
the role of natural history collections is um, kind of entangled and, and with that of uh, universities, especially universities which have a lot of natural history components, not necessarily the basic sciences, but also the applied sciences from biology to veterinary forestry and agriculture. So the MNH is a university-based museum. Uh, it ensures a comprehensive coverage of biological organisms in its reference collection, um, from microbes to mammals. It's an amazing array of collections and extending now to some geological and ontological specimens. Hopefully we'll go through that as well. And the role of the MNH is, uh, the mandate is to serve as a key repository and center for research and education on Philippine biodiversity. Uh, with emphasis on studies around Mount McKinney. So we are quite lucky because UPLD is at, uh, well, covers much of Mount McKinney apart from being at the base of the mountain. Um, the image slogan is to bring nature closer to the people and bring people closer to nature. So it's what uh, we want to, to kind of imbibe into our visitors, uh, understanding nature uh, a bit more closer. So the role of these collections um, uh, is, of course, enriching public knowledge, not just from uh, a university standpoint, not just for teaching. Of course, the, the MNH itself was created uh, because of um, the teaching collections. There were um, a, a different set, a different teaching collections put together to become the Natural History Museum in New Pilos Panos. But again, these, um, how the relevance is in terms of enriching public knowledge can be delivered through not just a set of collections, but also to other areas uh, which help enrich it. You know, not just stagnant as the collection itself, but also developing the collection, making use of that collection, and again, looking forward into what other ways you can make use of that collection. So the heritage, so again, four areas, the heritage collection itself, uh, from those uh, years long of historical data uh, that were collected, you also have collaborative research, both internal and um, in collaboration with different museums, uh, different universities as well, uh, to help build that collection. Um, you have to always update. And of course, you have your extension services. A lot of things that um, allow us to make use of the services for that particular collection as a reference collection for identification, um, making use it for um, developing uh, media programs, and of course, for public education, it's in case of exhibits, uh, both um, on exhibit at the museum or virtual or online. So let's start with the heritage collections. Here's a sample of those um, specimens. Of course, uh, amazing that part of the robot collection is housed at the um, uh, UPLB MNH. And here's some of them. Uh, these are set of what we call purple throated sunbirds, and now split. Before then, they were collected as one species, the purple throated sunbird are now separated as two species. Uh, as you see, the one has a red patch uh, on the breast and the other one is a yellow patch. The ones from Western Mindanao um, is now a separate species, the Pocoma uh, juliae. So as I mentioned, um, the collection covers about 100 years of natural history studies uh, from the start when UBLD was created. Uh, a lot of the uh, teachers and professors uh, put in together their teaching collections. Um, and later in 1976 was um, developed into a natural history museum. And of course was established through the uh, UP, University of the Philippines border regions. So these uh, heritage collections are combined historical reference collections with a white taxonomic breadth uh, from, oh gosh, uh, parasites to algae to uh, mammals. Can, it, it's deposited to these different taxonomic collections, which are major collections in Herbaria. So uh, we'll go through them one by one. So the Botanical Herbarium, internationally registered as the College of Agriculture Herbarium University of the Philippines, or CAHU. So yes, it's, it is registered in, uh, into the global herbarium system. Um, 
They have the mycological herbarium, which is a collection of uh, fungi, mushrooms. Uh, we have the forestry herbarium and wood collection or xylarium. Um, oh, uh, it's recognized as the Los Baños collection uh, in the herbarium system. Then you have the, oops, sorry, let's go back here. Yeah. Xylarium, Hortorium, which is quite a conundrum for us of the name Hortorium. There's only two places which are known as a Hortorium. Hortorium in UPLB, which is a collection of live plants. So there's, it's almost like a botanic garden, but not necessarily. So we also have the UPLB uh, Makiling Botanic Garden. There's also two other gardens within uh, the campus. Um, this one's more of a collection of, say, uh, the bamboos. There's a bamboo stetum, there's a palmisetum, so there's different sets of, and often they're associated with horticulture. So, um, Hence that hort named Hortorium. But uh, the other Hortorium I know is the Bailey Hortorium from Cornell, which probably arised from um, the collaboration between UPLB and Cornell University in the 60s. One of the largest collections of insects and arthropods in the Philippines is, of course, housed in the entomological collections of UPLB MH. Um, hence, it's a very large collection, well, about 255, 300,000 specimens. Or more, I'm mistaken out this the, the current count. Um, again, all of these collections are can be uh, uh, referenced online, so just go to the MNH website. The zoological and wildlife collection, which includes the DS Boar wildlife collection, uh, has all the uh, birds, mammals, herbs, fish, and uh, other invertebrates that we have. Uh, also, malacological collections. So there's a special set of collections at the museum. Um, we have donations uh, from living individuals, individuals. And so there's some are geological specimens, a few fossils. Uh, so we call them as part of being housed in the exhibit. So they're part of the integrated exhibits, but hopefully it's gonna be developed into a useful reference collection as well. Then you have the microbial uh, culture collection, the algal culture collection. Uh, which uh, includes both live collections. Again, some of the first uh, uh, registered internationally into uh, uh, a system for uh, culture collections recognized around the world. Okay, so aside from the heritage collections, we build in that collection through collaborative research. So you've developed uh, a lot of research programs. So the museum has its own uh, research programs uh, focused on caves islands and of course uh, more recently on forest canopy um, but again we'll develop it, uh, a bit more in terms because we do have uh, a large group of curators which have different uh, specializations so if you want to see all those curators there is a again a list on the website so it all focuses on key biodiversity programs such as uh, cave ecology or speed biology um, islands um, montane or uh, forest fauna um, uh, fauna and flora, as well as life in the forest canopy. So we had a recently uh, a IDR USD uh, concluded project on the forest canopy. Um, hopefully, we'll do. Uh, uh, currently, the museum has the uh, caves uh, research through DOSD. So. Um, the uh, research is also focuses on organisms uh, with potential for developing byproducts, uh, models for toxic resilience, um, and for control of uh, pest or invasive species. So there's a lot of work being, as well as um, uh, bio products for uh, herbal medicine, and of course, uh, microbes uh, are now being studied at the museum. Um, so that's one of the roles um, um, for the caves research. Of course, the contributions of these researches have led to the discovery of species that are new to science and also allows us an extensive review of uh, the taxonomy of a particular group of species uh, and their phylogeny. Um, so um, having sat as director for two terms, there are, they have named 
three species after me. One is Fungida con Gonzalesi, which is the blue jay vine, and then a moth and a blind pygmy cave cockroach. So apart from those uh, collaborative research, you have extension services, uh, which of course help uh, relay the knowledge that we want to, to on natural history um, across different generations, um, not just for visitors, not just for the university staff and, and, um, and students, but also uh, for visitors. We have these extension services. Um, so it's a, a longer list of new services on the website, but just to emphasize, uh, specimen identification. So a lot of students from other campuses and other universities require um, specimen ID certifications. Um, so you have also for if you use a, a scientific name on your thesis, there is the scientific name verification certificate. Um, the museum also has internships, of course, during the pandemic, all of these had to stop, so everything had to change online. But yeah, I think hopefully when the everything eases out, uh, the museum will be re reopening their internship program. Uh, they also have a reference library. There is a wildlife uh, library now housed at the museum. Um, they have biodiversity seminars before they were all face-to-face. -face. Of course, with the pandemic, it moved on virtually online, uh, including the training programs and so and the short courses. But again, um, all of these will then change when um, restrictions have been lifted. Uh, of course, a lot of the curators and staff are, are connected to national programs uh, on biodiversity research and conservation. So you have a long, a lot of curators involved with uh, technical support for uh, certain national programs from the Red List uh, to certain zoonotic diseases. All of them are members of the EPLB Zoonotic Center. And um, we're also the entomologists are involved with uh, invasive species such as the Popolisa. So in line, and then the fourth part of that uh, role of, of a museum collections is on public education. So um, it's, even though it's a reference collection, so it's nice to, to be, the museum was able to put out exhibitions, both dioramas and, 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 and um, uh, interactive uh, exhibits um, on a building, which of course now being renovated, hopefully will reopen soon. soon. So uh, we are, the MNH currently not housed in one building, they're composed of at least four different locations. So the main building houses the, uh, the dioramas and the exhibits, but most of the reference collections are in three other buildings. So again, edu public education with exhibits and diorama and both taxonomic and ecosystem-based displays. Uh, so we have forests, uh, wetlands, and then we have these different taxonomic groups from um, um, vertebrates to um, arthropods. They incorporate both preserved specimens, uh, taxidermy specimens, as well as models, and then, then live organisms. So I'll, uh, I'll, folk, I'll um, describe that a bit further later on live exhibits. Uh, to increase that relevance, to showcase familiar species of fauna and flora, and highlight endemic species, of course, from in the Philippines, uh, especially those at feature species that are found around non Guinea, again, as part of our mandate. So it's, it's amazing to me that one of our uh, favorite ones is jade vine, because the jade vine was, of course, first recorded in Mount Matibin. Then you have uh, a species of Rafflesia, which, of course, uh, occurs also in Mount Matibin. And with the pandemic, of course, everything had to go virtual. But before that, we already started, the museum already had started to work online. So developing the um, more interactive um, website, as well as putting up all the social media posts, and of course, putting up the YouTube channel. So the, this is the, the older version, I'll show you the current one. So uh, the MNH has a web page, YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, uh, all the usual trip advisor, research page, Twitter, again, to reach a global audience. So here's the 
current uh, website. So you can go through the different histories and our current news. There's a new species of moth that was named after our DP president, uh, Concepcion. So you go through the website, there's a lot of interesting news about it. It also links in to all the social media accounts. Um, also, if you go up on the, the tabs, you have areas of research, collections, so the different collections, each goes through all those, as I mentioned, and then the services. Um, and more recently added are the virtual uh, web pages, so it connects to all the virtual reality uh, exhibits. So it includes the one from Baliktana, which emphasizes on the 500 quintintinia of the Philippines. And then you have the uh, some of the uh, Makiling Arc photos also on, on virtual exhibit. So in Gotha, I think it requires art steps for you to open, but anyway, it goes directly um, to art steps once you click on it. So this is the uh, UPLB MNH uh, YouTube channel. So a lot of the seminars, both previous seminars that are face to face that were recorded live, are and then you have your virtual ones that were done over the two years of the pandemic. Uh, hopefully, will the museum will restart the face to face um, seminars once UP of course reopens all the the face to face system um, for not just the classes but also for um, seminars. So you can go through there. Also, some of the um, documentaries that were developed by the museum um, are also housed in this uh, in the YouTube channel. So yes, please watch them on YouTube, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. Um, Dr. Morris also asked me to, to look at other things that we're developing. Um, so we. So mentioned about the digitis, we talked about the digitization of the biological collections. So there is a website there um, on uh, UPLB website, which mentions the digitization of the biological collections um, and work. So you can go through that. It's in the uh, UPLB Agora site. So a lot of the specimens are now being digitized. Um, photograph, they had some, um, um, special means of, of lighting, um, even some which have multiple uh, images put together as a uh, reference library for, again, um, this, there was actually a project both within uh, UPLB um, and then one other one which was supported by uh, GBIF, uh, wherein it was uh, uh, able to, um, develop further uh, the means to digitize these uh, specimens. Okay, um, there are future uh, trends that need to be adopted by the MNH to improve its services. Some of them are more interactive virtual uh, exhibits. Um, of course, the online collections have been developed. Uh, we need to revitalize the exhibits. Um, a museum is currently the building is now being renovated. So hopefully uh, when it reopens, there'll be a lot of new exhibits to, to look into. We also need to emphasize on our connections, not just with natural history, but also with um, uh, folklore, um, like uh, the ethnobiological significance. Um, so it's just things in ethnobotany or ethnozoology that can be added. Um, even with linguistics, so looking into local names, has anybody documented local names? Um, again, the names that we recognize for Hornbill, for example, is Calao. But Calao is an adopted name from Spanish and French. Um, what was the original name that was used by our ancestors? So things that uh, like this have to be documented. So it's, it's part of understanding um, our own natural history is through uh, recorded history, not just natural history, but also uh, with other means. Um, hopefully, the revised or uh, the renovation of the museum will also be uh, improved in terms of accessibility. So here is a um, a artist's conception of what will be when it reopens. 
again, our notion of museums before um, for a lot of the public is their old dusty collections, but now it's being replaced by more interdisciplinary approaches. Um, it's not just about zoology stuff, it also integrates with a lot of other sciences. And then uh, it, it, it actually is more into public awareness. So it captures you in terms of, of exhibitions. Uh, there is also an increasing trend in museums worldwide that incorporates live organisms uh, in their displays and exhibits. And of course, models to replace specialty species, which are hard to find now or hard to create. It, it, you notice a lot of these exhibitions that we see are actually models. Um, you don't actually put the actual um, dinosaur spe a skeleton on, on an exhibit, um, but they, rather they replace it with models. Most of these um, important collections are actually housed in the reference collections and protected. So the museum has done a lot of, of uh, displays which incorporate live organisms. We have the epicenter, which allows of, has the Hoya collections and other epiphytes uh, featuring microbes uh, and aquariums. Um, we had a paludarium, which is half aquarium, half uh, terrarium, which houses herpeta fauna. Um, so again, it has to accommodate more hardly common species, but species found in not maketing, um, again, requires less complex captive management because uh, zoological specimens are hard to keep. It's a 24 seven job to keep um, live exhibits. So it has to be uh, well managed into um, um, something which is feasible within the museum environment, but still quite interesting. So we're using insects, um, frogs as part of the exhibits. Uh, we're quite lucky because we are in the Philippines. so. The exhibit is in the Philippines and it's uh, in a tropical environment, so it's easy to incorporate uh, certain species uh, outside or along the museum. Um, so you can extend actually your exhibitions outside into the gardens and, and add in those labeled um, information kiosks around the different specimens around it. So like for example, there's the jade vine is housed on a uh, pergola in front of the museum. Of course, the museum provides a venue for, as a university museum provides a venue for student training through our internships, but also because some of our students work on taxonomy and phylogeny or certain specimens that involve uh, parts of the collections. And of course, they are now um, housed at the museum. Um, so it's not just the interested, but also the students themselves, okay? uh, mostly graduate students. And there's close cooperation with the different colleges where all these teaching uh, collections originated, uh, often associated with the natural sciences. So from forestry to agriculture, to veterinary medicine, to environmental science. And of course, all of these uh, faculty um, involved in these different taxonomic groups, which help us with the projects and many services uh, serve as curators. So again, there's a list of curators involved in the website. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. So again, if you have any questions regarding the services of the Museum of Natural History, go to their website at mnh.upld.edu.ph. Uh, there is again the set there on research, what our research programs are, uh, the collections, uh, all the different collections involved, and then you have the curators as well as, well as the services. And if you have any uh, direct um, inquiries on the service about the museum, you may contact the current director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, um, who is our current director of the Museum of Natural History. Um, so again, a thank you to uh, Museum Management Training Year 2, to Museo Cordillera, Chet, and Yubi Bakke for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, you opened a lot of things, no, uh, especially on the interdisciplinary uh, research no, in working with museum, uh, natural history museums. 
as well as the the educational uh, aspect now of this more importantly and uh, the post, the many services no that uh, museum of natural history can provide okay so uh, we are now accepting questions from our participants uh, all over the philippines so um yeah okay the questions are coming all right um okay the questions here are uh, are now here, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. So uh, you mentioned uh, so many uh, purposes of the uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, you did not mention natural history of, um, from the Na National Museum. Did you mention Museum yes, of Natural History in the I National guess Museum? I have a, a picture of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, in your opinion, um, do you think that uh, the worth no, of these natural history collections are properly understood by the public today? Um, what's your thoughts on that one? Are, are, uh, now that we had the two-year pandemic and we're slowly opening up uh, some museums, no? uh, do you think that the role uh, or relevance of natural history museums are understood by the public? And if you say yes, no? Uh, what could be the indices or the indicators for this awareness and appreciation to biodiversity? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yes, I forgot to mention a bit about the National Museum, but again, because they are not a university museum, so I'm going to expound further uh, on the National Museum because they are a national uh, museum. So they are the, the new name is the Natural, uh, the National Museum of Natural History, NMNH, I think is that, with the P at the end, of course, from the Philippines. Um, it's amazing now because um, before, oh, I remember because when I was a student in biology and zoology, I go to the National Museum to look at the records on birds because I was studying birds for my, my, for my um, undergrad. And um, it's amazing they had the reference collection, but also they had the, uh, a library collection of all the uh, descriptions of the birds of the Philippines. And um, it's, for me, I think it was like a treasure trove of, of information. And nerdy, nerdy, but yes, that's how you feel about it with your, if you're um, passionate about your, your study. Um, so I remember now it's a basement of this building, but nowadays because of uh, funding uh, that was developed and now housed in their own building, which is now, I think, a former tourism building. Right? Um, yeah. Actually, nandun ako nung bumisita ako nung nilalagay nila yung pangalan ng natural history. They were painting the name. I don't know, I was like cheery-eyed watching them paint natural Ay, salamat. The Philippines has its own natural history museum. Um, because you always go around, if you travel around the world, every country has their own natural history museum. Smithsonian, of course, is the one for the U.S., um, which is the USNM. There's a Natural History Museum in, in the UK. There's a Wena Museum in Japan, but each one showcases their heritage. And of course, specimens from around the world. Pero nga tayo, parang for the longest time, ay na dun sa basement ng Congress building for now, at last. So I think that's one very good indication. It was also uh, not just the exhibitions, but also the collections are also being well kept. Maganda na yung kanilang reference collection. Um, they have more activities. If you go to their IG account, <laughs> I go to it, so I don't know for notification. So all the amazing new activities that they have. So um, kudos to the, to the National Museum for redeveloping that program. But what is also amazing is the university museums. Because na na ng awareness nationally, but the mga natural history museums, which are collections of the different universities, biological collections, tinagamit natin for teaching. We now recognize their value. So each one has also kind of like um, developed it, they kickstart some of uh, the development of putting exhibits, putting better uh, um, storage facilities. I think that was kind of a, uh, a ripple effect, knowing that the country has emphasized on it. Might not be given time. Ay, salamat na recognizing natural history. Well, not just natural history collections, natural history collections, but museum collections in general. I think it, it is the same for also for ethnographic and anthropological collections. Nung na-develop yung National Museum, parang na-excite tayo lahat in terms of 
redeveloping all the regional ones as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I I went to the National Museum of Natural History Museum of the Philippines. No, it's quite a huge space, and I think it's four floors. No, and then uh, they had a very uh, interesting interactive um, exhibitions as well. No, so that's a good Sunday meeting place. No, for some children and of course the teenagers are millennials. No, to visit the Natural History Museum. Okay, the uh, other question is uh, specifically for the university museums in UP Los Baños in particular. Uh, how did the uh, UPLB Museum of Natural History help meet the challenge of uh, the biodiversity crisis and of course climate change, which is uh, now, uh, you know, we're confronted with this um, issue on climate change and biodiversity crisis. How did uh, UPLB in particular, uh, the Museum of Natural History, address this issue? Thank you for that question. It's an amazing question as well. Because that actually reignites that. Because it's like, ah, there are specimens. What can we do? They're in a bottle. But that represents your history. It's, it's recorded history that specimens collected during the time before climate change was more apparent. Well, the climate changes have been occurring for many years. There's an impact, added impact because of human influence. So we want to study that further. I mean, separation between what was natural and what was unnatural. Actually, thinking of the word unnatural, I've seen um, mm. a, a museum called Unna a Museum of Unnatural History. This is an amazing collection that includes um, an exhibit of um, Dolly, the first ever cloned the sheep. So, and you, you specimen in Dolly, the taxidermy, and then she's a museum of unnatural history. So, again, it represents um, everything about the Anthropocene, what the humans has changed uh, from climate change to biodiversity loss, to invasive species, to pollution. So, a lot of these are man made. And that kind of um, our heritage collection was collected either during or prior to those major impacts of human, of the Anthropocene, of human influence. So that can give you the, 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 the baseline data to start with if you want to make comparisons. So I think, uh, yeah, reference collections are reference collections, they're a reference to a time line in our history. And of course, as represented by specimens. So this one, climate change. Again, uh, nowadays with amazing technology, I work with historical DNA. I want to work on ancient DNA, but I work with historical DNA. I can use DNA and eDNA for, for looking into how species occurs and distribute and distributed around the, the world and how they're related to each other. And so I'm pointing of it. So even these dusty collections, clean them up, you can still get tissue from that and still get mm -hmm. DNA. And then that DNA allows brings you a lot more information. Although there are a lot of stories about bringing back extinct species, you need a whole genome for that. That's a lot of data involved. But of course, they were able to bring back an IBM Ibex, which was extinct, for a short time. It didn't survive quite long. But again, that's one step already. Whether they, it, issues on ethics, whether you need to bring them back. dinosaurs, dinosaurs. But there are some species that were lost because of the humans and whether that's ethically correct for them, for us to bring them back. But again, the technology is increasing and it's how museums can help develop those technologies. Okay, it, doesn't stop us. it doesn't stop us ajar, it goes beyond. Yeah. Yes, oh, um, uh, you mentioned about looking at reference collections, no? So I know you've been all over so many natural history museums, not uh, looking at, studying, analyzing collections from all over. Uh, when it comes to the UPLB and other natural history museums, uh, what advice can you give in terms of preventive conservation? Because we talked about preventive conservation for artifacts, and we know that uh, the collections no, in your museum are all organic. No? And uh, yeah. when we see the collections, for instance, at the Field Museum, it's like they were um, taken yesterday. No? It's well-preserved and all that. So 
in our collections in the country, uh, what kind of preventive conservation is being done uh, to keep the integrity of the collection uh, for future research? Yeah, um, um, it's still amazing how the Philippines is still actually getting to do that. Uh, and all the other Southeast Asian countries have the same problem because we live in the tropics uh, and because of the high humidity. Um, dito nga, it's so weird being in Southern California because even though it's warm, it's dry. Mm. So everything, you know, it's well issue shadow with humidity. And, and of course, that helps preserve things if it's dry and warm. So it's not just the cold, but it's important that it doesn't mold, it doesn't reconstitute uh, that becomes uh, food for other organisms. That's what it's problem. It's going to be edible for insects, for example, because it's, it's, it's reconstituted from dryness. So, yeah, you have to protect it from um, humidity because it's being, being attacked by, by organisms that will eat it it's because it's an organic uh, compound. But also you need to protect it physically because it's a fragile, everything's fragile. So as it dries up, it becomes fragile. So I mean, I'm divided, it's just the specific, because they're teaching collections. Uh, our specimens need to be handled. They need to be examined. So there are certain guidelines of how to handle it properly and not destroy it. Because kakahawak mo na kakahawak. Nagutay-gutay na lahat ng balahibo ng ibon. So there's always that set of reference collections that you can use. And also ones that you need to protect. And uh, hindi mo dapat pinapahawakan unless necessary. So, especially the heritage collection. So you have to disentangle those two uh, parts of uh, which one is your reference collection that it needs more protection, which one is your teaching collection that requires more handling. So that would make two things. Of course, your reference collection would be the ones which are older or have more significance. And then the ones are kind of, uh, actually you can use models for that or specimens na hindi na ginagamit before, na wala lang tag, hindi na siya ma-recognize or use. So that can be part of your teaching collection. Okay, I think I'll be able to answer. Again, ayun, you know, humidity yeah. is our major problem. So mm-hmm. as you know, at this point, the case of Baguio, medyo maglamig-lamig. But still, the humidity is quite high, so you have to have the humidifiers. And for us, especially if you work in the government, you need to the current. Because it has to go through a, a constant temperature and a constant humidity. When you look at the the current, the humidity is So you have to, again, it's not just the purpose, but also management and you know, issues. So I don't know if the National Museum has those problems. Ah, the cinco na patay mo na air condon sa reference collection. I don't think they have those problems. Kami ganon pa rin ba? Like you have to shut down the collection well, I think after. Be for all, not just for government, even with private institutions. Uh, yes. So, right. So, uh, thank you for that no uh in in insight no so you talked about earlier about uh repatriation of this bio collections uh in the previous webinars we talked about uh digital repatriation no? so photographs of uh artifacts collected during the colonial period and we've seen um the collection at the U- university of michigan of the Dean Worcester collection of, uh, cause he was an ornithologist in the first place before becoming an American governor uh, to the Philippines. So uh, is there a possibility uh, of repatriating this or have you any uh, experience or knowledge about uh, repatriating natural history collections in, in the Philippines or in any other places? Because I know that there's a big project where I'm also involved with the Recollect, Reconnect connection of the Dean Worcester collection. So I'm working more on the colonial ethnographic photographs. So I am uncertain about the uh, natural history collections. Now, have you, you know, were there talks about repatriating physically or just digitally uh, this yeah. bio collection? And thank you for that question, because we are one of the examples of a, species, a specimen that was repatriated. So actually, yeah. naman is a specimen that was on loan for a long time. So it's amazing that they, the, the, the specimen was returned. 
to the EPLB and NH after it was uh, after its use was was uh, completed. So in a way, it's not a patriot, but it's actually just returning alone. Pero being the only specimen of that particular species, uh, it's a, a holotype, so it's important that it's important to to its original. Um, actually, for all specimens, I don't think so. Not all specimens that were collected in the Philippines by these different museums, especially the Andami holotypes in the British Museum um, and um, housed in the Smithsonian. So, I think those were collected prior to any laws that were developed, especially with the Wildlife Act. So mayon, meron ng, uh, with the heritage law, uh, all specimens that are collected are new, holotypes should be in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So often because you need to study them, you have to borrow it first, how to whether it's new or not. How would you know if it's a new species or not if you're not gonna analyze it? So you have to borrow it and then repatriate it later once the, the analysis is complete and return it to the Philippines. Okay. So that's part of the new heritage law, I think. Yeah. yeah. Which brings me to another, uh, maybe a recommendation or a suggestion on this uh, bio collections that we have, natural history collections that we have in uh, various repositories. No? Uh, maybe you can lead that later on or your team uh, with uh, UP Los Baños. Uh, there's a project at SOAS in uh, UK London uh, about mapping Philippine material culture. So these are uh, collections of uh, for instance, I have an interest in on Northern Luzon collections that are found in different ethnographic museums all over the world. But uh, the uh, natural history collections from the Philippines have not been mapped out yet. So there's a, maybe I can share later on. Um, uh, th there's a previous webinar uh, by Dr. Christina Juan of SOAS uh, who presented that on uh, Philippine map. Uh, mapping Philippine material culture. I was wondering if we, we can also do mapping of natural history collections from the Philippines. These are collections outside of the Philippines. Uh, can this be done? It's already being done. So it's, uh, there is a program called GBIF. So GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Database, uh, which is a, a Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So GBIF, um, uh, not only puts together um, all the information on distribution or uh, photo records, but also museum records. So, meron jang abundance choices. Uh, is it a museum specimen? An crossing museum specimen? So, um, a lot of museums have already done that before. So, in my case, it was easier for me to track down specimens that I needed to, to study. Um, for the so birds, we had ornis, uh, then became vert net. So everything was all, all vertebrate uh, museum specimens um, records that were digitized and put into the internet. It allows you to find particular species and where it's from, collecta. So a lot of those basic information are there in that particular database. It's now all placed under a bigger um, database, which is GBIF. Uh, yeah. Even the new records, such as eBird, which are uh, bird sighting records or bird photography records are now included in GPIF. So it's easier for us now to track down birds <laughs> um, or specimens. So the museum has started that digitization process. And of course, even with the data, uh, what you can share. Um, so we team up uh, with uh, ACB, the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, which also housed in Los Banos. So um, the MNH is now doing that with a lot of specimens from herbs to birds. And even now they're starting with, with uh, botanical specimens. But they get later that can be accessed online through GBI. Yeah. Okay, that's a good thing to know, uh, Dr. JC, because some of our startup museums, no, uh, specifically in the natural history, can use this as an online reference no, for cross-checking or even validating or providing uh, information no, for our natural history collections. Okay, we have a question from Adrian Peter Cartalaba. No? So he is asking if you have any advice for storage and handling for old bones no, that are very fragile and almost disintegrating. 
Uh, so Adrian, uh, anong klasing bones ito? Um, I presume they are animal bones kasi may human bones din naman. No? So what is your advice on this? Well, a bone collection should be separate. All dry specimens should be separate from your fluid collections and you're from often also separate from your uh, skin collections. So your skin collections are the ones which are taxidermy because they may not um, Often the problem with um, bone collections, um, lala nyo yung pagka bumi nag ng biology class, may skeleton dyan ng yung pusa, may skeleton ng ano na nakamount na. Those were all created uh, using dermestids. So, um, often, pa kaya malinis na malinis yun eh. So, there are insects called dermestid uh, beetles which help clean up uh, the skin and the, um, the ano ba, sinew. And talaga, ang linis-linis niya, matitila lang talaga is the buto at saka the um, isang dito buto na which is cartilage. It's amazing. So, you never mix that with your skin collection kasi pag nakawala yung may natira pa doon kahit isang baby dermestil kakainin niya yung collection so that's why you need to uh, protect your taxidermy specimens from being eaten by pests um, kaya kailangan siya bago mo ilagay doon sa specimen cabinet either finifreeze or finifumigate um, para sigurado walang insects tsaka yung of course all your collection boxes should be insect proof Pinumigit mo nga, bukas naman yung, <laughs> bukas naman yung draw, well, di papasok din yung mga silverfish, or what, moth, ano, um, those moths that, that feed on, on fur. So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's good that you separate them into a box. And of course, it's better to, um, kung buo pa siya dikit-dikit, uh, binabalot siya ng um, muslin para makabuo. And some, yeah, of course, yeah. add, Number tattoo. They, they write the number of the specimen, uh, number on the bones itself. Para magkahiwahiwalay man, may madiit na number that can still be traced. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of There's a lot of things that can be done. Hindi kaya discuss ngayon sa sambung, sa whole. Oh, should be on management. Uh, but again, you can go through a lot of manuals on this. I think we discuss it on during the first training. In taxidermy, we didn't have much to expound on the bones, but we did discuss a bit on preservatives, uh, preservation um, techniques. Okay, thank you, uh, JC. Uh, so we have another question: Do you use any software application in digitizing the biological collection, and what are your process or procedures to digitize the collection? Oh, good question. So, uh, what at tapos na kasi yung pagiging director ko nung no, no nag-start the digitization process. But again, we had to uh, develop cert- there was a, uh, a set that was uh, so it's a GBIF meron na cassette na yun na program. So again, we got training through um, ACB with that. Um, so they had the, the software as well involved in putting it together. Uh, any information na ano mo. So it's, if there is a training program so you can ask uh, go to the website I mean, ACB Siguro if they still have that training program uh, for GBIF. Um, there's also another group, Herpot, which helped kind of put together a workshop which we attended. Dunasi Bula nyo yung aming interest into GBIF. Um, of course, we also had a grant from GBIF, so it's good that we had the grants to buy the computers and also to start up with the so the MNH is doing that now. So it's getting uh, for details. You can go to that website that I showed in Agora to to give you a more a better idea of what programs they're using. Because I mean, I don't each one is not just um, the program that does the database, but even the imaging. I remember that we had to take uh, pictures of um, insects. There are different kinds para mag 3D siya. We had to take it like different sides out of the and people put together your image para mas magand. So yeah, Florante Cruz was, our, was in charge of that, uh, the imaging process. So uh, we can ask him directly. He's a staff at the museum. Okay, thank you, JC. Um, I think uh, if it's a startup museum, uh, uh, we had a session on photographing artifacts no, in year one. And then uh, see... Dr. Christina Juan of SOAS mentioned the app called Omeka. 
uh, na pwedeng i that's a cataloging system but the process of just you know digitizing it you can actually use that similar with the artifacts now the only difference is that uh, as a natural history collection may iba ibang angles na pwedeng gawin no of course pareha din sa artifacts but you can start with that especially if you don't have funding yet no pwede mong kunang ng magandang picture no hindi kailangan expensive ang camera na DLSR ka agad no katulad ng sinabi o pwede naman yung magandang kuha from phone muna no and then use a ring light no so we when we were uh, teaching photography of artifacts we just uh, the museum doesn't have funds yet for a very good lighting system for the objects, a very good uh, high-tech camera. No? So sabi ko, hindi naman kailangan yun. If you're doing Zoom, get your ring light. Okay? Uh, ginagawa din ng staff namin yun. Although we have an in-house cameraman, a uh, photographer, kunin nyo yung ring light and then put the object in the middle and then take good snapshot of the, art, uh, of the artifact or the object. Then you can actually produce uh, good photographs from them. But if you really want the more professional looking type that you can actually upload uh, on your website, you better uh, invest no, dun sa mga equipment, sa mga app, or even software that you can use for digitizing. And uh, I think you have to have this kind of foresight, no? Uh, tanungin nyo kung saan nyo ba gagamitin yung output na mga photographs or uh, digitizing, etc. No? Kasi one, you can use that for your own uh, collections management system internally in, in the museum. Second, uh, whether you publish that no? in the form of an exhibition, no? kailangan magagandang photos, or uh, the digitiz digiz digitization process uploading that in your museum website. No? So, kailangan din at the back of your mind, uh, saan mo ba gagamitin tong mga images na to or uh, is it only for digitization? So, maraming mga paggagamitan. No? Isipin nyo yung saan gagamitin yung mga images na ito. So, you can just do it in one sitting para less yung effort. No? Na, or sa, ibig ko sabihin, uh, ma, ma optimize yung effort nyo in doing uh, uh, photography or digitization in one go. Hindi pa ulit ulit. Kasi, I know JC for a fact that the handling no, of this uh, natural history collection are very fragile. No? So, kung kukunan mo siya ng photograph, ilang beses, ilang beses ba dapat nilalabas yan? No? So, uh, in one go, no, para less yung handling and less yung deterioration, less yung exposure, you have to plan no, in doing the photography in one go and then put that in the catalog. Then you can just uh, make a photo archive of all these objects that you can pull out when you use it for publication, exhibition, or uploading uh, it uh, on your web museum website. Okay. Actually, it's the same with, uh, with live specimens. So we were... The museum was actually very lucky yes. because uh, mm -hmm. National Geographic Photo Arc actually visited the museum and did some of their photography on specimens from Mount Makidi. So you can actually go to, to Photo Arc and see and Google. I search Molang University of the Philippines Alabasu, mga photographs of live specimens that, that were mm -hmm. taken using the, the Photo Arc system you know, in, um, in a, um, a well lighted uh, system. So we can add it to the sets of lights and, and backgrounds, which make it uh, put emphasis on the specimen, not just the background. So I do put the air black to your background because it's an amazing set yeah. of uh, that puts yeah, so it, uh, emphasis on the specimen. Yeah, iba pa pala yung uh, question earlier on um, uh, collection, no? That these are in the museum already. Iba pa pala yung live. Oh, yes. um, Especially for specimen collection. Before mo siya collectahin. Dapat alam mo na itsura niya buhay. Yeah, Kasi uh -oh. pag hindi naman na ng preservative, pag iba na itsura niya. The coloration okay. uh -oh. disappear. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very, very important, no? So uh, when we visited other museums, no, you, yeah, you, you showed us photos of the collection of birds in the Phil Museum and the one at the Pitt Rivers Museum. They are well preserved, no? The, even the color of the feathers are all there. Uh, and they have either illustrations 
of uh, the bird no when it was alive no and then uh, maybe later on yung uh, photos niya na nakunan no when, before uh, caption they were captured no uh, so magandang tignan yung uh, various forms so uh, you do photography if there are um, botanical illustrations or um, um, natural history illustrations of that then you can put that in your archive as well then you can put that in the digital format no Okay, um, yeah, I talked too much. Anyway, so uh, uh, other questions here, uh, Dr. JC, uh, you opened this uh, question on uh, uh, the, the interdisciplinary nature of uh, Museum of Natural History, you know? Um, you mentioned about ethnobiology, ethno... Ethnozoology. Ethnozoology, you know? Um, I'm just thinking about uh, universities who have this cluster of museums within uh, a university. For instance, meron silang uh, ethnographic museum, meron silang natural history museum, meron silang herbarium. No? Um, can you tell us more on how uh, there could be collaboration between all of these um, uh, museums within a university and what could be a good thematic anchor uh, for this area of collaboration? Yeah, so uh, um, at the Botany, for example, there is research being done by the Institute of Biological Sciences and other uh, departments within UPLB. I think also outside UPLB, um, especially on uh, natural products. Um, so it's actually started with herbal medicine. Um, so a lot of natural products are involved. So because the museum had a really good um, showcase of uh, specimens, um, uh, involved now both uh, native and non-native, which were um, of of uh, herbal importance, both uh, through the natural components that they have, but also based on um, ethnobotany. So you want to make connections with the uh, 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 specimens that were used uh, presumably for this particular, uh, so not necessarily pre-tested. Uh, scientifically or medically, na na mm -hmm. um, these are either through folklore or through uh, the different thing, means na, na develop, uh, mm -hmm. traditional medicine, as we call it. Um, so yeah, doc, because of Dr. Cardenas, Lourdes Cardenas was our previous director. Uh, she was in charge of these natural products. So the connection between the museum mm -hmm. natural history and what she was doing with, uh, with, with, with bioproducts. Um, so that involves a lot of ethnobotany as well. Um, Sakin, I wanted to, being an ornithologist, I wanted to incorporate ethno ornithology. So I, uh, one of my mentors in, in Oxford started the IWA or Ethno Ornithological World Archive. So I started doing a research on um, local names because we have a rich data, not just cultures, but also. Um, different languages and dialects and how they change across the different, um, how the names would have like Uwak. Uwak is the same everywhere. Basta Uwak, Uwak yan sa Ilocano, Uwak sa Cebuano. But there are bird names which vary across the different languages. And magugulat, ah, ito yung tawag nila dyan. So parang, mm -hmm. it's amazing because a lot of these languages are now being replaced by Jejomon. So hindi mo na, because before it disappears, ano yung, I say either this, the people who saw them or knows the name of that particular bird in the wild uh, may die, hindi na ipasa kasi wala, na, naputol na yung oral tradition. Tapos, mm -hmm. wala naman nag-document, wala nag-record. Kasi sabi ko, okay. So a lot of bird photographers and bird watchers are now doing this. So every time they post something, they have a the local name. So that's amazing already. That's already a start of that integration. So it's not just a big, with the, the specimen, but now you're integrating it with hobbyist for photographers, for watchers. And it's a nice integration across that uh, science to um, citizen science. And you mentioned natural history art. There's a lot, there's an increasing wave of people doing natural history. Actually went to Las Vegas last month. So I oh, you know, gallery dito in Las Vegas, full of natural history art, the middle of the of course, I'm a but it's really, it's amazing that there's a recumbence of, of what we understand as natural history in a different context, whether it's digital or a new wave, a new form of, of art form. But again, we go back to that original, before what happened picture. So they have to make a really good representation of a specimen to describe it. 
if you remember, there was an exhibit about the description of the Philippine eagle. So then there were line drawings of how, well, what the Philippine eagle looked like. Uh, but again, these are all lithographic uh, examples. Because the time there was no photograph much to it. Well, yeah, 89 years old, but because there were older ones, there were all um, called it hand painted pa ngayon iba eh. Kasi you just had the ink added on. I forgot the name of the, how it's all lithographed. But and then, uh, iba yung hand, ano na na yung addition of the colors. Yeah. Mm -mm. Just to, to cap plates yes. eh. Di ba? Ang mamahal nun, kaya dedikado yung mga libro na luma na may mga plates kasi yung ginagawang pang display ngayon sa bahay. In the frame nila. But again, those are amazing historical accounts of both natural history and art. So that's a, a great um, combination of both. Mm -mm. Just an okay. Yes, yeah, so and then, uh, like so many possible collaborative uh, work no, that can be undertaken by our local uh, museums and universities, and especially those are those museums who are starting to decide no, whether the museum will be natural history or ethnographic. There's so uh, many possibilities now on doing this. Um, let me just emphasize again the uh, Global Biodiversity Info Facility. Is that the one? Yes. Is there a website for that? Yeah, so uh, you can actually refer to that because I'm also very interested in. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, bio collections now elsewhere, so that I was just wondering whether uh, we can do the same. No, okay. Uh, other questions coming in. Uh, you mentioned that the UPLB is now currently being renovated, and um, how how are they? stored uh, in, uh, while in transition. No? And number two is yung question on um, to make it uh, safe, uh, future-proof. No? Anong mga kailangan gawin sa isang natural history museum? I know that, uh, kunyari, may uh, tropical country, may either masyadong mainit, tag-ulan, may earthquake, may baha. No? How do we future-proof our natural history museums? Thank you for that. Again, uh, um, with the new director, uh, Dr. Marian De Leon, she had already had a lot of those future-proofing workshops. So just as I was before I did my sabbatical, uh, so I came back as curator for birds. So you know, she had a lot of these workshops done for future-proofing. Um, also because we were we, we were able to implement the renovation. So after I finished, we got the money, but of course it took some while. Exacto, actually, no. Natapos ako ng March, saka na-approve yung building, tapos sabay nag-pandemic, you know? So, it's a lot of things that were being done across the time na umanda siya, so it, it, it got held up a bit. But, um, luckily, the museum building doesn't um, house all the collections. So, it's actually more of the staff, uh, the, the, the facilities, uh, Plus a few or two, two or three of the collections, and, 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 and like the fluid collections and the microbial collections are there. But everything is all exhibits. So, pwede in tanggalin exhibits and then we're put on storage. So, not all the reference collections are there because we don't have the one building. So, we also had the proposal to have an annex building decided to become that one major facility designed for. Kasi ang hirap kasi na. Um, you repurpose mo isang building. The Luma, especially a lot of the buildings in Los Banos were done in the 50s and the 60s. It repurpose mo siya for this particular purpose. They were all created to become either dorms or, or classrooms. Iba talaga yung design that makes it humidity proof, uh, insect proof, disaster proof, fire proof. Kasi heritage collections, once you lose them, they're gone. I, I, diba? I think everybody got a moment nung nasunog yung collections in Brazil. Diba? That was one major, like, oh my God, ano, ah, paano may babalik lahat yung nawala? And I think that's the biggest fear of a lot of other museums, not just the Philippines, all over the world. So you have to make it disaster proof. And the Philippines is disaster center. Meron ko ng bagyo, meron ka pang... Nagulat nga ako na tsunami drill sa UST. Sabi ko, Kakalapit sa coast, may tsunami drill kayo. 
But um, so it's a, it's a lot of things that we need to consider. Um, even simple things as humidity and an open door, which a cockroach or a, a cloth yeah. moth or a domestic can crawl into. Like for example, your textiles, if they're made out of animal fur, nakapasok dyan ang dermesti, bubutasin ngayon. In just a matter of two days, boom, dust. Ganun sila kabilis. Because I've seen a dermestid, nung nilagay namin yung skeleton ng arang uh, specimen ng bat, so may laman-laman pa siya. Siya, natanggalin mo ko namin ng laman. Kasi nalagay mo yung dermestid dito. Two days, three days after puti, the skeleton is puti. Cleaned off the flesh. Oh. Oh. Sila kabilis, oh my God, parang piranha na but again, they're amazing to look at. They're amazing to study. But that's how things work. And yeah, you need to protect them. Yeah, future proofing is enough. So hopefully, the museum uh, in the responders will get a new building that ha- houses all the separate collections because they're now housed in at least three different buildings. And of course, you, you have the facility that allows you to make dehumidifying and test proofing easier. Yeah. Okay. Mas, uh, kung sa ethnographic artifacts, no, mas doble yung care, no, uh, preventive conservation for natural history, no, because Imagine. they are really, you know, they Imagine could melt. Imagine yung letters, no, di ba, yung mga papers, kakainin siya nung they have those Taisanura, the silverfish. Yeah. Alam mo, napaka-harmless. Pag kinain niya yung papel, what a good buy. Yeah. Okay, there's a question from Sol Maris Trinidad from the UP College of Music, Ethnomusicology Center. Ang tanong niya, does the UPLB MNH have a collection of the sounds or calls of the birds and animals? How helpful are these recordings in the study of birds and animals? Very good question. So because we, um, a lot of the specimens we house were collected prior to that. So um, nowadays, there are a lot of people uh, who do research and surveys, um, as well as bird watching as a hobby, that uh, take photographs, videos, and, and record calls. And now they are available online. Because it's not just, because the time kasi na, uh, collecting this data was based on expeditions. Um, so pag may museum expedition, either collaborative with Filipinos or with uh, uh, and foreign institutions, dun lang nagkakaroon ng data. Uh, of course, the National Museum has their own expeditions, the MNH has their own expeditions. So we have trickled, depending ko ano yung collect ng the data. But now, because of the advent of digital technology and online databases, you can actually uh, do this for, through citizen science um, by recording, if you have the proper recording material, to upload it to a database. Of course, there are curators within these databases which help determine the quality of your of your recordings. So, so for example, there is an online database, it's free, called Xenocanto. And Xenocanto okay. houses all the bird calls, actually nature calls, not only mammals, but it started out with bird calls. Yeah. This and is then, the one? Yes. So yeah. there are a lot of, not just Filipinos, but a lot of foreign bird watchers or surveys that were done that were able to collect uh, bird calls and bird songs more elaborate um, depending on the quality. Uh, so may quality A to, to D and A. Uh, kung maraming uh, noise interruption, may kotsing dumadaan, may sirena ng bus. <laughs> So, puta ka sa D. Pag, pag ka very clear at yun lang yung call, it become A. So, again, uh, these are very useful in terms of, of course, there's a lot of species that are still gaps because a lot of endemic species in the Philippines that nobody has seen or heard. So, the Philippines has a lot of gaps for this. But, of course, amazing that because there's a lot of uh, foreign bird watchers that did this and, of course, uploaded their data. Okay. How fascinating, no? Ang dami na palang uh, developments uh, dyan. All right. Also videos. So if you go to eBird, eBird has photographs and videos of birds of the world. E-bird. So a lot of bird watchers and bird photographers, of course, bird photographers, and the next step is videos. They upload them and donate. They donate their videos to, to eBird. So that's for okay. birds. Mundali kami. 
for the others, medyo mahirap pa. So yeah, the zebra. Amazing, no? Wow. Okay. So siguro, meron na bang mapping of biodiversity in the Philippines? Like this one? Yeah, yes. Uh, we've been using that for looking into, say, distribution of each of the uh, species. So, we have a Philippine Red List Committee, uh, mm-hmm. the DNR, and of course, at the same time, uh, Wildlife uh, Conservation Society of the Philippines also had their technical working group. They were all looking into, uh, looking into status of each of the species in the Philippines. Um, so, a lot of these uh, databases were very useful. In looking into the status, whether distribution, kailan, and ito pa ba siya, sino kakita last time, are the records, uh, kasi iba din yung historical records, you see the former distribution and then the current distribution, how much has it, so meron mga species na ang dati, for, over the Philippines, ang dami dami, and then, so what happened? So then that gives you a red flag, oh, bakit pinla silang pumonte all over, dati meron sa kalamba, ngayon sa Palawan na lang nakikita. Oh, okay. things like that. So it's amazing. Right. All these databases. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Adrian Cartalaba. Is it better to ha- is it better to have a separate reference collection for the purposes of accessibility for students and researchers? Researchers. Yes, indeed. So your reference collection is all the collections that we have that are well protected in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, I'm trying to separate it from the term teaching collection. So all can be still a reference collection, but you have to separate your teaching collection. As the teaching collections are the ones which you handle the most. So dapat iwala yung lagi hinahandle, lagi may ano. These specimens, they have of lesser value in terms of say as a reference, rather than wala na yung tag, or hindi mo na ko sanggaling. Or at least this preservation method is not as, and of course, they shouldn't be endangered or anything. They should be rare. All rare and endangered ones should be part of your reference collection, um, which is the uh, more protected one. So, meron katalag kan separate. Of course, still your reference collection, depending on how much usage it is, should be made available. Because everything is, wala ka naman choice. Eh. Um, in my case, I had to look at um, extracting DNA from a specimen in Africa only specimen, holotype. Sa so, dili-dili ka na ibon. Kasi kailangan aralan kung same species ba siya dun sa other species related to it. And I was so scared taking a, a DNA, a, a tissue sample. Kasi yung dalawang pa sa ibon, apat lang yung toes at each. So there's eight pads, what we call toe pads on, on, underneath. So there's only eight toe pads where you can collect uh, the material for DNA analysis. And you can only do it once. Kasi, it was only eight. Pag kinuha mo na yan, pito na lang. Seven, na mo wala. Pag wala na, goodbye na. Wala ka rin makukuha na lang ng tissue sample. Because it's the only specimen of that particular species in the entire world. So I was so scared when I took, kasi I had to be the one to, to do the DNA analysis. Kung tinan lang may nakuha kami DNA, we're able to finish the paper. But, but that's it. It's how you, it has to be made accessible for those particular circumstances. Hindi pwedeng tago lang forever. You still have to make use of that specific. There's also okay. a system for it as well. We call it destructive sampling, but it's a really bad name, but yeah. Kakatakot, no? Yung destructive sampling. Diba nang napwento ko yung sa Pit Rivers, when they asked me to help with the, yung cloak ni... Cloak ni Hawaiian King something. Uh, the yeah, it was, no, it was Polynesian. So, yung yeah. sa Hawaiian were made out of Hawaiian honey creepers, but the ones yeah. in Polynesia were made out of pigeon feathers. So, nung nilay out nila itong cloak na kinolekta ni James Cook, nilatag nila dun sa ano, okay. naga assist ako kay Dr. Buster. Parang, oh my god, pag binabunod ka na isang feather, parang kasalanan mo. So, you have to be very careful. Of course, you still have to examine it properly to determine. Anu species yung ginamit nila. And you can do that with a lot of examinations, not just DNA, but looking into the, what we call the feather structure. So merong um, mic- microanatomy of feathers. You can determine whether it's a, a, a pigeon or a hawk or a, or a fowl or a passery. It's amazing. Of course, DNA is the best, but amazing. Oh, amazing. 
you can use technology well, to understand this history. You're in your full elements again, Dr. JC. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, we finish all the questions now from our participants. Um, would you like to say any last words or advice for startup museums, no, or museums who have already uh, a natural history uh, museum in place, no? So, ano yung mga practical advice mo naman sa kanila? Ah, um, don't be afraid to make use of whatever technology is available. I think a lot of things can help improve whatever you have. And also, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do in terms of creating exhibits that are inexpensive. Um, interactions that can be more... Uh, so yeah, I've been going around the different parks and footprints. So they just cast the footprints of whatever mammal it was. Because there is a coyote, a mountain lion, a bobcat. So they create those cats from models. And then the kids would stamp them. It can be a rubber stamp. Eh. Or put a sand bed. And that helps create I mean, yung, yung positive footprint on that uh, particular area. So it allows you to, to identify the footprint of that particular animal in the wild. And in a way, something I foot big foot big tangan. But if you look at it, that's um, that's knowledge um, required by that child. When they are say hiking, paano pag nakakita ka sa trail ng paanang bear or na mountain, they become cautious and you understand how. I don't know. There should be some sort of, of uh, knowledge that attaches to it that you need to all. We have to be careful or you have to be watchful for these uh, in a way that helps you understand. It's not just the natural history, but also any connection say, on your everyday life. So, yeah. yeah, so more on uh, experiential, no? Experiential. And then a combination of technology and then other resources. No? So you can actually, if you have time to visit uh, UPLB Museum of Natural History, oh, eh, close pa rin, no? Uh, but hopefully, when it will open soon, uh, you can also visit. And also, our Museum of Natural History at the National Museum of the Philippines. No, uh, Bisitahin din nyo yun. Kasi the last time I was there was, I think, last month. No? Punong-puno ng mga bata. No? Uh, so, let's uh, instill curiosity and, you know, uh, providing them impetus no, to have a greater appreciation of our natural history. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jay Z Gonzalez from uh, California. Ano oras na pujan? Gabi na. Uh, early morning. Gabi. Okay, gabi. Okay, it's eleven, uh, almost twelve now here in the Philippines. So thank you, thank you so much again for uh, spending your evening with us. Uh, and sharing your knowledge and expertise on the natural history museums. Okay, thank you so much, uh, JC. Thank you again. All right, for our uh, next session uh, coming up next week on May 19 and 20, uh, we will have uh, who's next? Um, uh, Miss Joanna. F. Medrano, she's the creative director of Aramid and also the graphic designer of Mosaic Cordillera. She will talk about exhibition design and fabrication. No? So this is like um, uh, considerations no? on how you can um, uh, design your display cases, anong uh, classing uh, mga uh, uh, um, mounting um, paraphernalia that you need for your museum, even the look of your museum, no? And of course, this is uh, greatly related to uh, curation, yung curatorial work na kailangan, and of, of course, the research, no? Which pertains to the content of your exhibition and how do you execute this to your exhibition de design and fabrication. That's on next week, May 19. And on May 20, 2022, we have Dr. Ethel Villafranca, uh, who's now with the Museum and Collections Department of the University of Melbourne. Uh, she will talk about marketing your museum. No? So, uh, okay, uh, meron ka ng museum, pero you also need to promote them in various platforms. 
how you can do that. Now she will help us uh, give us practical tips no, on marketing uh, your museums. Okay, so um, uh, to our participants, uh, please don't forget to log in. Uh, I mean, log in and fill in our feedback assessment survey. It's now flash on the chat box. No? So we need this uh, for your attendance and also to monitor no? uh, those who are completing soon uh, this museum webinar uh, year two. Then uh, on June, uh, I mean, on July 18 to 23, 2022, uh, we will be bringing some of you or all of you uh, to participate in the face-to-face -face, uh, museum training in Baguio City. No? So we are now planning for that and uh, we hope that you can uh, actively participate. We will be um, asking maybe one or two representatives from your museum uh, to uh, come to Baguio no? and to meet our technical um, experts no, in museum work, uh, including uh, Dr. JC Gonzalez no, for this uh, natural history aspect. Okay, before I end, I would just like to share a very interesting um, website no, pinag-usapan namin ni Dr. JC kanina, itong digitizing uh, natural Digitizing the Natural World. This is a project of the University of Oxford uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, meron silang mga, uh, yung nasabi ni Dr. JC kanina, yung mga luma no, na mga, mga references no, or collections that are still there that you can actually do a uh, digitization. You can visit uh, this website. No, in digitizing natural world of the Museum of Natural History. No, so ito yung parang um, um, part no uh, on digitizing your collections. No, so some of you ask uh, a, a question on that. Maybe you can also refer to this um, example. And then may we also promote uh, the UP Los Baños Museum of Natural History. They also have their website and these are accessible online. No? So marami silang uh, mga projects, publications, and also the collections no? uh, in their Natural uh, Museum of History. No? So so many things going on and a lot of activities uh, that you can find uh, from their website. So if you have further queries about building your own Museum of Natural History, you can send your queries directly to Dr. JC Gonzalez, no? All right. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, um, uh, and I hope we see you again next week for uh, the other session uh, I mentioned. Okay. Oh, I forget that the new director of the uh, Museum of Natural History is now Dr. Marian De Leon. No? So yung kanyang contact details nandun naman sa kanilang website. Okay, thank you very much and uh, see you next week and have a good weekend.